Right, what we want to look at is some aspects of, of categories and keywords. Um, one of the problems about designing your site is trying to work out the best way of actually getting people to where you want them to get to, whether it's with a DVD, photographs, web designs, whatever. It's, you've got to get people to the right place. Um, is it about? Is it info? Um, team names? What, what kind of categories do you have? So it's important to think about some of these things. Um, I'm going to look at various aspects of this. Um, key question is, can the user find what they're looking for? Ultimately, when you come back to your each uh, thing you have, whether it's your DVD showreel, your web design, even your classic page portfolio, can you or the user find what you're looking for? Um, if the answer is no, there's no point having it online because no one's going to look for anything or find what you want. So you've got to make sure the user, not you, the user. And we'll emphasize that more when we look at some other questions. The first thing I want to give, provide the information about is how do people look for information? How do they go about finding out what they want? This is what's called information seeking behaviors. And you might recognize some of the ways of looking in yourself or the way you go about looking for things. So what do users want? Sometimes they're going for the perfect catch, which is what's called known item seeking. But you know what you want and you're going and looking for precisely what you want. There's lobster trapping. If you imagine dropping a lobster pot at the, at the sea, uh, the fisherman doesn't really know what it's going to get. He hopes it's going to get lobsters, but it might get crayfish. It might get other things coming into the net into that lobster pot as well. So it's really exploratory. They don't just put one pot in, they put hundreds. So lots of kind of bits in, in different places. So that's exploratory. The other one is indiscriminate drift netting. Um, you see well, how they fish like that. They basically kind of have a, a trawler or two trawlers and trawl a massive net. And they drag up from the seabed whatever they get. Rocks, fish, um, fish they don't want, you name it, they get it in their nets. That's really kind of the exhaustive search idea. If you look at this diagrammatically, then each one has its own kind of sphere of looking at things. The everything search is really this massive big search of absolutely everything. The exploratory seeking um, is that slightly smaller one. And the smallest is when you know an item seeking, when you know what you want, you know the right thing. If you're going into someone's website, you want to look at their photographs of horses. Um, perhaps that's what you're aiming to look at. You go for, um, you go to their website and you expect to find a category that says horses. You go for horses, you look up what you want to find there. If you're looking at animals generally, you might well look at a category that says animals and just look and see what there is underneath that category. So everyone has different ways of looking for things. So what do users do to find information? They do several things. They search. So they're actually going to specifically go into Google or they go into your site with what might be a search function. They fi try and find what they're looking through a search. They might browse. So they actually might someone said, oh, this is a good website, go to it. And they just literally browse through the website. And uh, browsing is very much like, um, you imagine sheep and cattle do it all day. They go in a the field. They don't say, oh, I fancy about did that bit of dandelion in the corner. They literally just browse across the field all day, day eating. And that's what a lot of people do when they go on the web. They browse. They don't actually, they just don't really care where they go to. Oh, that's interesting. I'll look at that. Uh, oh, that's interesting. I'll look at that. They're actually kind of going place to place. The other thing that also happens is people ask, where do you think is a good site? Um, what's a good site to look for photographers? They might direct them to AOP, they might professional photography unit. They might say, well, go and look here for a particular type of photographer. These are all methods for finding and what I call basic building blocks of information seeking behavior. So someone might be doing a bit of searching, a bit of browsing. So they use a search term. Then after that, they've got a number of websites to actually browse through. How many, how many far do you go down before you get bored in Google? Do you go on the first page? Do you stay on the first page or do you go to second or third or fourth? Second? Any, any advances past second? Well, yeah, I'll go to the third page because usually what I'm looking for isn't on the first, although it should be. 
Yes. Yes, yes. So uh, we, we don't, some people do, will stick to, the, some people will just stick to the first page. What's the first page is what they go for. Yeah, yeah. If you do some actual searching, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to go across the web browser and do a search for a church on a hill. And what I get back will depend on how I search for it. So searching in different ways will give you different answers. Right, so I get um, a church on the hill dot com. Which actually is obviously about um, a, a, an evangelical church on a hill somewhere. But it doesn't actually provide me with a picture of a church on the hill because I've just gone through the normal text Google. If, however, I went through images, I'm much more likely to get a photograph of a church on a hill. So depending upon how people actually go about searching will depend upon what kind of image you actually get or what you actually find. Different people will search in different ways. So it's important for you not just to think about how you search, but also to try and think about how other people might go about searching or finding information you might provide on your site or uh, whether it's a video, photograph or web. What you provide within any structure are a number of different components to help people find where they are or to navigate. Uh, these are browsing aids, search aids, content and task, and invisible components. First one, browsing aids are really organizational systems. There was a site-wide site -wide navigation. When you go into the first page, you have home, uh, photographs, uh, commissions, awards, um, me, as an example. And you know whenever you go anywhere else on the site, these things will all be on every single page, will have those same categories, like a site-wide navigation. Then, when you get to another page, you might have local navigation on a particular page. Perhaps you've got pictures of animals. Therefore, the animals page will have perhaps a number of subcategories. You click on one that leads to one picture. So that's really kind of local navigation. You might have site maps or tables of content, site indexes, site guides. A common thing people are starting to put in place are what are called site wizards. In other words, if you go into a site, you don't know what you're after, but it's, it's going to guide you through the system. So it asks you questions uh, that are very simple to begin with and literally take you through to uh, where it thinks you want to go to. The problem about that is it's as frustrating as answering the phone and getting, please listen to the tone and after the tone, please gonna, uh, press one for this part of the company, press two for this part, three for this part. That's a site wizard. It's leading you through a number of steps. The other one are contextual linking systems. In other words, you have categories or, or labels or links. In any text, you might well have a link within the text. Perhaps it talks about the fact you've been on Safari and you saw a giraffe. And that giraffe will have, then have a link from giraffe to your giraffe pages. Searching aids are things like a search interface. Don't forget, some of these you can actually get free for your website via Google. And lots of other companies provide you with free search engines you can plug in. These often use a query language, um, something like Boolean uh, and or not, something quite complex, others aren't so complex. And behind the scenes, they have retrieval algorithms, so have a way of actually turning your words into a search. There might even be search zones, i.e. subsets of site content. So rather than a simple search, you might have an advanced search, and you search for your word within one part of the site. So you search for the drafts within the animals part of the website. So you're more likely to get a hit that way. That's pertinent to what you're looking for. And then you get search results. And the presentation of that content um, should match the query, theoretically. As we know from most search engines and things to try and look for, um, what we ask for in terms of the word might be not how they've categorized it. Content and task are the kind of standard things we use on an everyday basis, whether it's in our essays, reports, um, independent studies, writing up something, we use headings. So we have a, a large heading, small headings, things like that. Embedded links, so it's links from text to content. 
um, metadata that's embedded in photographs, you can actually extract that with web, um, special ways, ways on the web. Uh, chunks of logical content, lists, sequential aids, which suggests where the user goes next. If you like this page, go and look at this page. So if you like my animals page, why not go and look at my plants? Because it, it, obviously someone who likes natural history might, they might not like just animals, they might like plants as well. Or if you like this one rock band, uh, you'll also like the photographs of this other band. So there's kind of contextual linking. Sequential aids. Um, identifiers. Quite a lot of sites these days use a strange thing called breadcrumbs. The deeper and deeper into the site you get, the more you get these, kind of, these small kind of links which tell you where you are within the site. The invisible components are often things that are there even though you don't realize they're there. These are things like control vocabularies, often uh, subject specific, for example medical or technical. But you get, you get this with a lot of companies. Um, if you type in the word human resources, um, do you get the personnel department or people's department? What if they, they actually call it a people's department? Um, a lot, that's a popular term for personnel or, or human resources. Most people know that no one would ever go into and type into a, a website people's department. Most people would look for personnel or human resources. Uh, so you would actually make sure that the word personnel and human resources brought up the people's department, what are you calling your personnel this week. Um, so you'll try and make sure the vocabulary fits uh, when people search for things. So this is using things like thesauri, uh, which suggests links to broader or narrower terms. There might even be rule sets um, if search a certain word, present a certain amount of content, this content with it, that word. Don't forget a DVD menu is no different from a website, from a photographic gallery. You have to know where you want to get to easily. That really is the, the key crunch to any search or making it available to people is that if someone trying to get somewhere, they know where to get to from that first page. That it's obvious. How deep your content is put will affect, affect what's looked at. So the deeper and deeper it is, the less likely people will actually have um, uh, be bothered to look at it. The real problem is is that the problem is getting worse rather than better. As time goes on, things get worse and worse and worse. This is um, a graph um, from Rosenfeld and Moorfield, which is a book all about information architecture for the World Wide Web. And it should be kind of obligatory reading for all the web designers, unfortunately. Uh, but it's a good book when it comes to actually describing things. But um, if you think about how when monks copied by hand, might be a smaller number of books were copied and copied and copied, then Gutenberg's press, hand press, uh, 1480, the Vatican Library, 3,500 volumes. Um, we've got more than that in Britannia Mill Library now. Mechanical typesetters, uh, 1900, London Library, 500,000 volumes. Internet explosion. So as We've actually got more and more more information and data, photographs, you name it, got more and more things available than we ever used to have. Which means uh, we're going to obviously, you're, we become smaller and smaller flies in the ointment as time goes on. Um, if you use certain search words, you get crazy numbers. I put the word photographs in, and in Google, it would return me 101 million pages. In the images section, it returns me 30 million from images. So 30 million are labeled photo photographs or photography or photography. Even I'm not unique. If you put in David Bryson, the reason why using the quotes, it kind of limits it to that kind of phrase. Um, that brings back 39,800 pages. And honestly, they're not all me. Um, if you remove the quotes, then you get 285,000 um, pages back. So you can see immediately you can have, you, we've got problems uh, on the internet. Um, that's why often um, your website is not passed through Google, it's passed via word of mouth. We've got more problems than that. Um, 
we've got problems with words. What I'd like you to all have a quick go at is think of the word pitch. And what does the word pitch mean to you? How many, how many uh, different kind of uh, meanings for the word pitch can you think of? Literally, just spend about kind of five minutes just kind of quickly thinking, see how, how many you can actually think of the word pitch. These are the ones I found. <laughs> Throw or toss a ball. Cricket pitch. Uh, it also can be a position where you sell goods. You have a pitch in the marketplace. Uh, black sticky substance used for coating hulls of wooden boats. Uh, salesman patter. Element of sound. Also, rise and fall of a boat at sea. You can talk about boat rise and falling and pitch. So the problem about this is that as soon as you look at that kind of word, um, it's got so many meanings, they think, well, what, what is the right meaning? Uh, hands up, is tomato a, a vegetable or a fruit? Um, do anyone know why it's actually classified as a vegetable? Hmm? Um, no, it's actually, it was actually um, classified as a vegetable um, because um, it's to do with tariffs in the United States. And the United States is classified as a vegetable because it has a tariff applied to it. Fruit doesn't have tariffs applied to it. So um, people try to get tomatoes in uh, to the United States um, because it was a fruit and there's no tariffs on fruit. Um, so it had to be kind of literally when you go into American um, law, it's actually defined as a vegetable by law. So it actually had a tariff. But technically, it's a berry. It turns to use more of a vegetable, but it's kind of some of these things have odd meanings. It's all to do with ambiguity. And one of the things you sometimes um, go when you get a search term, you search in, in um, Wikipedia, you actually get a list of terms. Um, rather than getting the word you search for, you get this, which is what's called disambiguation. So um, what it's done, obviously typed in chalk, disambiguation, and it gives me all the different meanings of chalk you might get. Um, so sometimes a lot of um, things like Wikipedia have realised um, if you just type in chalk, the problem about that is there's not one meaning of chalk, there's lots of meanings of chalk. Um, I thought if I was searching for an image of chalk, the search engine won't know what type of chalk I want. It will just return me photographs of chalk. It could be the White Cliffs of Dover, it could be a piece of blackboard chalk, it could be anything. Uh, it could be a rock. So that's one of the problems to do with searching. Another thing to do with searching is what do you expect to see? Something that's heterogeneous, this refers to an object or collection of objects composed of unrelated or unlike parts. Heterogeneity or homogeneous refers to something composed of similar or identical elements. If you think about it, if you go into a website that's full of photographs, do you expect to have um, a photograph of a giraffe, then a mollusk, then a house, um, then a boat? No, how would you actually expect to see things? That's what I mean by heterogeneous. It's nothing um, similar. Or do we expect things to be homogeneous? In other words, we expect to find um, architecture, then it's got a whole series of houses in architecture section. So what do you expect to see when you go to a website? Do you expect it to be categorised or not? If not, why not? Or how do you, if it's not, how are you going to get people to look at all the images? Or do you want to do literally anything and everything so people just don't go for a category? Now, these are things you might need to think about. One of the things, strange things that's common to almost everything we do these days is that everything relies on looking at the internet on databases. If you think about it, even a simple web page is a database. In other words, it's a, a, an element that contains text, and it might contain pictures, but it's actually containing information. Now, all a database is is a, is a place for storing information. Um, you put together a showreel on a DVD. The actual program that designs it is relying on database elements. You design a content management system for somebody, that's really used as a database. Um, you design um, something like SciShowPro.net and put photographs in. You're putting photographs into a category, into a database. 
is literally built on a database. Almost everything. Um, you might think, well, I'm actually going to be using uh, an image management system like Aperture. Aperture is a database. It's a database plus a photo engine. Um, most products on the market are all based around databases, like it or not. The database is often invisible to you as the end user, but you have to think that some things need organizing, so you have to organize it. Unfortunately, um, there are, if you take photography, there are problems with photography. You take photographs, once you've taken the photographs, you then have to add, you might have to do a bit of Photoshop. After you add Photoshop, you might need to add keywords or put keywords in place. It can take as long, once you've taken the photograph, to do the Photoshop bit, then equally as long to add metadata to each image. If you've got 100 images you've taken in a shoot, unless they're the same thing, you'll need to add a search term to each of those individual images for your database. Ultimately, not only are most internet entities now databases, um, they display their results or contents as web pages from databases. So if you think about it, Google is just a massive big database. So when you actually put a search term in, it provides the answers that you want. Picture libraries, DVDs, blogs. Blogs are based on, on a database. When you put an entry in, the entry today will be given today's date, which goes into a database. Then tomorrow's entry will have tomorrow's date, we go in the next entry. And when you actually pull out an archive, it will actually pull out an archive based on months. So uh, websites, RSS feeds, all driven structurally by a database or a way of creating or showing text from data, um, text, images, videos, etc. There is a new way of showing content which is becoming uh, more pervasive, which is tag clouds. These are a new way to show links and to search content on websites. And the principle behind this is rather than um, you deciding what are your main keywords, you let your users find out what your main keywords are. Um, it's a new way of organizing content. Traditionally, things like the Dewey Decimal System in the library, that was organized by information professionals. For example, you know when you go downstairs and look for photography, its Dewey Decimal number is 740. Whereas tag system, um, given to website or images by users, display weighted by popularity, or what's called folksonomy. So you go into um, a website, um, and you can actually sometimes add your own categories to things, or your own uh, links. Perhaps you find a bookmark. If you find a bookmark, you put it into the category you want to find it in. You don't say, oh, I'll use the same category as they've used. You use the one you want to use. Um, that's the way things like Delicious works. You actually um, tag a web page and you add your own tags to it and you build up um, a number of tags onto things that way. And associated with tags also is the frequency with which people tag something. Um, traditional headings work by the bolder the heading, the more important. Um, Obviously, irrelevant, very important, important, very important, extremely important. Size and weight implies importance. So if you have a big heading on your website, or a, a heading H1, it implies importance. H2, H3, or you go by subheadings, subheadings. A subheading implies lesser importance. If you're writing an essay, or structuring an essay, you might have the main heading, is large, bold type. Then the intermediate headings have smaller type. Same thing works with folksonomy, that the more people who give your website a particular keyword, the bolder that site will look in terms of heading. Look at the tag cloud from my collection of um, bookmarks on Delicious. Um, you can see the things I mainly tag. Um, learning, history, medicine, education, photography, portfolio, Web 2.0, tools. Anything that I tag more frequently will come out bold or larger type. Important thing to remember also is that information seeking is often iterative. 
In other words, someone just doesn't go in and find something. They keep on looking for things in the same places, or they have a way of working. They might find a number of pages, then hone down to one page they want. It's also interactive. They expect to get feedback from the site when they try a search. What you find at the beginning of your search may influence what you look for and find later in your search. So if you instantly find what you want, that's great. But if you don't find what you want, what you find straight away may influence what you do next. This is information seeking process can involve a wonderful element of associative learning. Seek and you shall find. If the system is well designed, you might also learn along the way. The key thing is to make sure that when people go to your site, uh, or they put in your showreel, they look for your web designs, they look for your photographs, that they find what they're after. Um, be careful about O words. Um, that's an odd one. Um, your website or what you design should not be obscure, opaque, you should not be oblivious to what the users want. You should not try and obfuscate. Um, that's like muddying the waters. So basically what you want is you want the last O word, which is obvious. You need to make things on your site obvious to the end user. Um, clear that when someone goes to the website, it's obvious what they're meant to do. It's obvious where your links are. Um, if they want to get in touch with you, it's obvious how to get in touch with you. Um, make things easy for people. The key to this often is what's called end user research. Um, most times you should actually, rather than starting with um, your portfolio, you should start by finding out from people how they would actually go about looking at your, your website or your database or your showreel. What would they expect to see where? That's end user research, finding out from other people what they actually expect to see. What do your users think? Once you've got a show reel, once you've got your website up and running, once you've got a collection of photographs, show somebody else um, amongst your colleagues here or other people, say, well, what do you think? Can you find um, what you're after? Uh, you could even do uh, end users testing. Um, give somebody a keyword. Um, I've got a photograph somewhere on my site that shows a boat by the sea find it and you can see whether they can actually find through the category whether they can actually get to that photograph or not so you can actually ask kind of observational behavior and when in doubt try also getting children to look through websites as well because they're the ones who normally point out the difficulties and problems um, I don't like the home button or the ho I thought that's the home button you know wh what is the button right button to press um, can they get to what they want quickly and easily the idea is to, it's nice to do things which are different um, and make people think, but actually your portfolio should not be about making them think. You might well have a separate page that makes them think, in which case the page is labelled experimental work, and it leads them off where they can have look at your experimental work to heart's content. For the most base of your work, it needs to be obvious where things are, clear, concise, um, and easier to look at.